Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're delighted that you've decided to join us. We study the Sabbath School lessons as prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And this particular series is entitled, The Promise, that is, God's Everlasting Covenant. And we're going to find out that there are different covenants that have been talked about down through the years. We're going to talk about some aspects of each of those covenants. This particular lesson focuses on all future generations, in quotation marks. So the, some of these covenants actually talk about something that's supposed to last for all future generations. See if we can figure out what that is. This is the lesson number three in that series for April 17 of 2021. As usual, we'd like to begin with a word of prayer. Our kind and loving Father, we are delighted to see how you related to those people, those relatively rare people in ancient times who remained very committed and faithful to you. We think of Noah, we think of Abraham and others, Moses, as we talk about each of them. Now help us to understand how some of these covenants will apply to all future generations is our prayer in Jesus' name, amen. Okay, well, we know, I don't have to tell any of you, that things deteriorated pretty rapidly from the Garden of Eden to the Flood. And how did that happen, Jim? Bacteria are organisms too small to see without a microscope. Even after being magnified 1,000 times, a single, common round bacterium appears no larger than a pencil point. Given favorable conditions for growth sufficient warmth, moisture, and food bacteria multiply at an extremely rapid rate. For example, some bacteria produced by simple fission. A mature cell simply splits into two daughter cells. When fission takes place every hour, one bacterium can produce more than 16 million new bacteria in 24 hours. At the end of 48 hours, hundreds of billions of bacteria will have appeared. This, microspo this microscopic phenomenon in the natural world illustrates the rapid growth of evil after the fall. Gifted with giant intellects, robust health, and longevity, this viral race forsook God and prostituted their rare powers in the pursuit of iniquity in all forms. While bacteria may be exterminated by sunlight, chemicals, and high temperature, God chose to check this rapid, rampant rebellion by a universal flood. Okay, that's from our Adult Sabbath School Bible Study Guide. First page for Sabbath, you know, April 10. It, it, it could have been God, in His foreknowledge, knew what was going to happen yep. and provided a, a protection, the boat, the ark, Mm -hmm. for those in his foreknowledge who he knew would get on the boat. Yeah. That is another way of saying it. It, it, uh, it depends course, on your uh, point of view. We can take that foreknowledge idea backward. Why did he create Satan if he knew he was going to sin back in heaven? God is love. Yes. And without the freedom to make choices, no matter right. who you are, you're, you're, there is no, without the freedom, there is no love. Yeah. That's yeah. keep it that simple. <clears throat> yep. Well, what kind of people lived before the flood? What were their skills? What did God say about them, Charles? There perished in the flood greater inventions of art and human skill than the world knows of today. The art destroyed were more than the boasted of arts of today. The great gifts which, with which God had endowed men were perfected. There was gold and silver in abundance, and men were constantly seeking to exceed their fellow men in devices. The result was that the violence was upon the earth. The Lord was forgotten. These long-lived race were constantly devising how they might contend with the universe of heaven and gain possession of Eden. This Ellen White manuscript release, volume 20. Uh, okay, this is something that very, I've never heard anybody talk about. Amazing. One of the older manuscripts written by Ellen White that hasn't been popularized. 
This long ribbed, well think about it. If you really, if you knew what's inside that garden, and there it is, you could walk over and look at it, wouldn't you be trying to figure out some way to get in there? Oh, yes. That's, a, that's really quite an insightful uh, yeah. message there. That's written by Ellen White, August 23, 1898, from 1898, from Sunnyside in Corumbong, Australia. Kerry? Yes, I used to live a few doors from there. I watched them re, they rebuilt that, brought it up to specs. It's got yeah. all of her orchard, everything. Yeah. There. And it's usually looked after by retired missionaries. Yeah, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. wonderful. Well, of course, I would ask this question. Who do you suppose inspired those people to try to... So who, what kept them out of the garden? Let's, let's talk about that for a moment. The angel's watching it with the sword there. The, so that's why it says here, what does it say? They, they might contend devising. with the universe of heaven and gain possession of Eden. Yeah. How could we get rid of God and his angels at the gate so we can go in there and get to the tree of life? Amazing. Why well, isn't that how it's going to be at the end yeah. as well? So now we've come down to the time of Noah. What can we learn from the story of Noah? Why would God choose to destroy the world? What could we learn from studying God's promise to Noah after the flood? Kerry? I'm reading from chapter 6 of Genesis, uh, verses 5 to 7. When the Lord saw how wicked everyone on earth was and how evil their thoughts were all the time, he was sorry that he had ever made them and put them on the earth. He was so filled with regret that he said, I will wipe out these people I have created and also the animals and the birds because I am sorry that I've made any of them. And that's from American Bible Society, 1992. Okay, now, considering God's foreknowledge, would it be correct to say that he was sorry that he made them at the point when he made them? No. He knew that what was going to happen. I, I, see, I don't limit God's foreknowledge. Yeah. I don't think God is learning no. on the job. I don't no. yeah. subscribe yeah. to process theology, which many people do. Uh, it's so I, don't, I believe God in his foreknowledge knew what was going to happen. I knew that when he created this earth, it was for the benefit of the onlooking universe. Mm -hmm. uh, that, that, in fact, they were the first one that got it, remember, mm -hmm. in, yeah. at, the, at the cross. So uh, there's another way of saying it. God in his foreknowledge knew what was going to happen, and he made a, protect, a protective uh, uh, provision. way of his, a provision, yes. Yeah. So we're not dealing with predestination, no. Kevin, Kevin theology, no. but well, we are also, I, to me, that he has the foreknowledge, but he's not a micromanager. Exactly. No. Yeah. Well, it's among other things, but he, right. no, because God is love. And it's right. very, it's got to be, the theology should be far more simpler, far simpler than most people, religions, have mystified it into being. That's my take on it, what I've learned over the years. So we ask, how could a God, and I want you to think about this out up there, you try to figure it out for yourself, how could a God with foreknowledge be sorry that he made all the creatures on the earth? Is that, is that, is that a, Something wrong with that? The truth about freedom and sin had to be fully demonstrated. In the great controversy, God has to prove his fairness and demonstrate the results of his plans and the results of Satan's plans. God was sorry to have to do this even before he created Satan. He knew what was going to happen, but he, he said, in order to, I have to maintain freedom, as Jim has suggested, Without freedom, you cannot have love, and God is love. He can't run a government that's not based on love. So this was absolutely, it was essential for the very character, because of the very character of God. I but, would, go ahead, go ahead. Is it perhaps uh, uh, right to say God created Lucifer versus God created Satan. That's right? correct. Yeah, no, it's. I think it's very important, yeah, very important. Very, for yeah, like people it. all over the world hearing. You know, no, God created Lucifer. Yeah, and beautiful name. Yeah, beautiful name. Yeah. 
So God had to take action in the days of Noah quickly because truth was rapidly losing its hold on the world. When the flood came, God had only one man and his family were willing to get into or on the ark. If God had waited for another generation or so, there would have been no one paying any attention to God at all. If we all try to remember that this earth was to created to educate the, the other earth. heavenly intelligences that were <laughs> that were here, remember in Revelation 12, yeah. the dragon's tail swept down a third of the stars of heaven. A third of the, uh, implies that a third of them left left heaven, but they still had two thirds that needed to be educated, mm -hmm. and maybe he'd win a couple some of those others back. So. I think it's well from God's original date of creation when everything was pro proclaimed very good. Look at what happened to the world. Transgression and rebellion had become so widespread that even God, loving, compassionate, and forgiving as He is, could not allow it to continue. Why did things get, go so bad so quickly? Genesis 3 6 The woman saw how beautiful the tree was and how good its fruit would be to eat and she thought how wonderful it would be to become wise, so she took some of the fruit and ate it. Then she gave some to her husband, and he also ate it, from my Good News Bible. A few verses later, Genesis 3, 11 to 13, who told you that you were naked? God asked, did you eat the fruit that I told you not to eat? The man answered, the woman you put here with me gave me the fruit, and I ate. The Lord, asked, Lord God asked the woman, why did you do this? She replied, the snake tricked me into eating it. And then Genesis 4, 5, but he, that is God, re rejected Cain and his offering. Cain became furious and he scowled in anger. So three verses later, then Cain said to his brother Abel, let's go out in the fields. When they were out in the fields, Cain turned on his brother and killed him. Genesis 4, 19, a few more verses on. Lamech had two wives, Ada and Zillah. Genesis 4, 23, four verses further on. Lamech said to his wives, Ada and Zillah, listen to me, I have killed a young man because he struck me. Genesis 6, 1 to 2. Now it came to pass when men began to multiply on the face of the earth and daughters were born to them, then the sons of God, that would be the people on God's side, saw the daughters of men, the people who were on Satan's side, that they were beautiful and they took wives for themselves of all whom they chose from the New King James Version of 1982. And then finally, Genesis 6, 5 and 11 to 12, when the Lord saw how wicked everyone on earth was, now evil the, their thoughts were all the time, but everyone, and then skipping down, but everyone else was evil in God's sight and violence had spread everywhere. God looked at the world and saw that it was evil for the people were all living evil lives. Obviously, these conditions by the time of Noah did not arise in a vacuum. Try to imagine what the beings in heaven were thinking as they watched things going from bad to worse. Jim? Apparently, Satan's power was growing. His warfare against... Now, this is a quotation. We want to make a note of that. Okay. From Ellen White. Uh, his warfare against heaven was becoming more and more determined. A crisis had been reached with intense interest, God's movements were watched by the heavenly angels. Would he come forth from his place to punish the inhabitants of the world for their iniquity? Would he send fire or flood to destroy them? All heaven waited the bidding of their commander to pour out the vials of wrath upon rebellious world. One word from him to, excuse me, one word from him one sign and the world would have been destroyed. The world's unfallen would have said, Amen. Thou art righteous, O God, because thou hast exterminated the rebellion. Ellen White, Signs of the Times, August 27, 1902. Now, this is a part of the story that most people know nothing about. And I want you to think about this. We're talking in the throne room of God in heaven. And people are saying, the angels, the angels surrounding God's throne are looking down, they're seeing the, all the evil that's just multiplying here on this earth, and they're saying right there next to the throne of God, what are they saying? 
When are you going to do something about this evil? Yeah. Wipe those characters out. Just, just get rid of them. You can think that God was not all that great of a manager, yeah. uh, a great CEO. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Well, do you think God ever discussed that issue with them? Did he talk about what he was going to do? I think he probably would have. You think he probably would? No. He went to the, we are told that we were created a little lower than the angels, so we knew the angels were created. They may yeah. well have gone to God regularly for well, he even, he even came down in person to talk yeah. to Abraham yeah. before he wiped out Sodom and Gomorrah. Yes. So, I, I, I hope someday we'll get to see those conversations. Yeah. When we see the great panorama. It must have seemed obvious to the beings in the universe that God must somehow eliminate sin. I mean, remember, they had, they had lived for who knows how many millions of years or whatever yeah. in a perfectly sinless environment. The entire universe was perfectly sinless. And all of a sudden, you had this cancer growing on planet Earth. Yeah. So, God must somehow eliminate sin. But how could he get rid of sin? That is what God's plan of salvation is all about. Does Ellen what say somewhere that uh, only in this earth, the Lord has given the power of procreation? Well, what she says is, we are a unique order of beings. And she goes on immediately to talk about our power to procreate. Yeah. So she doesn't just say it exactly in so many words, but she certainly implies that. Because then the Lord also says that there's no uh, marriage in heaven, so mm -hmm. there is no procreation, so it's possible. Yeah. That yeah does he, it say there would be no marriage, or does it say, it says you would be like the angels, something to that effect, yeah. but does it actually say that, I, I may be, Maybe good past. It says they'll, they'll neither marrying or giving in oh, marriage. Okay, well then that covers it. That. But mm -hmm. then I, I've wondered about that. I don't disbelieve it, but think of all the righteous people as we know it today. We've lost babies all over the place, yeah. and we're also told that they'll be given to their mother. So something's yeah. got to be. You oh, yeah. don't lose it, each other's company. No, at no, least. no, no. You will not. That's very clear. You will, you will know. We will, we, the Bible says you will know even as you're also known. Yeah. So in other places, there's other passages that says, the people who've, who've been married here, we will know our wives, we will know our husbands, we will know our children. Yes, we know that for sure. Whether there will be any new ones, that's an, well, I, I personally am very strongly of the opinion that when this whole sin thing is completely gone and there's no, Satan is gone, so there's no chance for him invading a new planet, yeah. God will go back to creating. Could be. I mean, that seems, makes sense to me. But they're still yes. going to be free. They're still going to be free. So that's, uh, there's, somehow somebody's going to have to do some educating or, yeah. if you're still free. Well, and uh, there's, the marks well, will never be gone. Go yeah, but, I don't think there'll be a, Second time around. Intelligent I, creatures. That, well, we, in Revelation, a couple of places says there'll be no more death. That's, that's the main thing that we have yeah. to, yes. to, to... Yes. But I, I, think there's, I think there's a simple answer to that, in my opinion. I think if, if anybody, a billion years from now, oh, decides to rebel, God will say, okay, you stand right here. Uh, we're going we're gonna to gather all those people who lived through the sin experience. Stand around here. This person wants to start sin all over again. He wants to rebel. What do you think I should do? And we will just take one look at him and say, step back. You are the only source of life. Yeah. Just leave him alone. And he will perish right there. And nobody will have any question about it because we know exactly why that would be necessary. Yeah, but then how do we, then are we going to redefine that? I mean, we, we can go all, yeah, all, all evening. Shall and shall not <laughs> rise up the second that's right, time, yeah. period. I think no, that's, that's important. Yeah, right. I mean, that doesn't remove your freedom. It just no. reinforces what we... We will not want we, to do that yeah. anymore. No. Those marks will I, I'm talk, always be there. I'm talking about maybe if God creates a whole bunch of new people, maybe yeah. one of them might, might try to rebel. Yes. Oh, yeah. Okay, Charles, what is God going to do about the sin problem? Romans 8, 3. What the law could not do because human nature was weak, God did. He condemned sin in human nature by sending His own Son who came with a nature like sinful human nature.
to do away with sin. Okay, Jesus came to do what? Away with do sin. away with sin. But, okay. but, but he did not come here to do away with the law. No, he didn't say that. No, the, the law is the, the, a description. It's not a proscription. It's not a an imposition. No, it's a it's a way to live. That is correct. Okay. So and what what did God do to get rid of sin? God through Jesus Christ demonstrated not only the beauty and holiness of living according to God's plan, but also the results of being separated from God, the second death. Jesus is the only person so far in history, in the history of the universe, to die that second death. And we are supposed to watch, we're supposed to look, we're supposed to see, we're supposed to think about what happened there and say, do we, do we want to have that happen to us? Well, let's go back to Noah. Uh, Carrie? Yes. Uh, reading uh, from Genesis chapter 6, verse 9. Noah was a righteous man. Blameless in his generation, Noah walked with God. And that came from the New Revised Standard Version, 1989. Okay. How do you suppose Noah remained a righteous man, blameless? How did he walk with God in that vile and rebellious environment? Did he try to stay away from other people? Did any of them want to get rid of him? I mean, think of the story of Cain. Yeah. That's not a whole lot different than Job's experience. No. Except for the fact that Job had some friends that uh, sounded very pious. Yeah. <laughs> no, but for 120 years, this crazy man yeah. building this boat. Now, he was given the dimensions. He said, but how did you know the buoyancy that they, they never had water, a yeah. yeah. body of water, you know, so, and then he preaches about, hey, live righteously, come yeah. to think. Yeah. He has spoken to the I, people. I think Noah went both ways, because it says he was a preacher of righteousness, yeah. so he had to have moved around. Uh, so. He had to, he had to speak to these people, yes. he had to, yeah. well, and I think they mocked him. In Second Peter 2 verse 5, Peter called Peter calls Noah a preacher of righteousness. Did Noah's preaching irritate his sinful peers, or did they just come around and just watch him? That was part of the entertainment. Well, Genesis 6, 8 says, but God found grace, I'm sorry, but Noah found grace in the grace eyes of the Lord. Lord. Right. New King James Version. So what is grace? This is the first occurrence of this word anywhere in the Bible. Did Noah, who was a blameless, righteous, and walking with God, need grace? Let us never forget that Noah, like the rest of us, was also a sinner. Yes. So how would the Bible writers, even God himself, describe your life? Would you be described as righteous, blameless, walking with God? What might a righteous, blameless walk with God look like in today's world? Genesis 6, 18. But I will establish my covenant with you, and you shall come into the ark, you, your sons, your wife, and your sons' wives with you. New Revised Standard Version. Well, look carefully at this verse. Here we have the basics of the biblical covenant that God makes with all humanity. God simply enters into a covenant agreement with us, but there is more to this covenant that first meets the eye. Notice first, obedience is involved. What were they supposed to do? Listen. Get on the boat. Yeah, well, listen. What I'm talking about, it, yeah. obedience is, it yeah. really is, it, it's, it's listening. a listening. Yeah. It's a, yeah. In order to participate in the blessings, they had to get on the boat. Notice also that God calls it my covenant. What does that tell us about the covenant? Even though our behavior is required, God is the one who makes the promises. Okay, compare Exodus 19.8. Charles, you want to get that for us? <laughs> Exodus, uh, are we at, let's see. Number 18. Number 18. <laughs> then all the people answered together, we will do everything that the Lord has said. And Moses reported this to the Lord, Good News Bible. And if you turn to Exodus 24, verses 3 and 7, it was repeated twice. So three times they said, We've everything that the Lord says we will do. And that was 
before and after the giving of the Ten Commandments on Mount Sinai and all the other rules. No problem, God. We'll just do it, right? <laughs> Even though that declaration, <laughs> yes, was accompanied by the giving of the Ten Commandments and that marvelous manifestation on the top of Mount Sinai, less than six weeks later, they were dancing drunk and naked around a fertility cult symbol that they had coerced Aaron into making for them. Clearly, our promises to obey God amount to nothing compared to God's promises to us. If we, before we go any further, yeah. um, I think that to me the first covenant the Lord, the Lord had made was in the Garden of Eden. Yeah. Genesis 3.15, maybe you could. Yeah, no, yeah. exactly. Imparted and imputed righteousness is a covenant that started right after sin entered yeah. this world. Well, the, really promise, the real promise in Genesis 3.15, not spelled out in any detail, but was God said, there's a serious problem here, but I will take care of it. I myself will take care of it. Well, Isaiah 53.11, what do we have here? Does God get, get any benefit from this covenant? Only the chance to bring a few of us up to heaven to live with him forever. Okay, Kerry? Isaiah 53, 11 in uh, uh, the Good News Bible. Is that, yeah, I was trying to think of the grammatical thing there. The Lord said, after a life of suffering, he will again have joy. He will know that he did not suffer in vain. My devoted servant, with whom I am pleased, will bear the punishment of many. And for his sake, I will forgive them from the Good News Bible. Okay. Now, what is, I want you to think about this. God plans to take us, if we make it to heaven, and he's going to take us around to the rest of the universe and said, these are people who in that environment chose to follow me instead of all the evil that was around them. This is my, this is my badge of honor. I, I think he's talking about their hearts were right with me. They mm -hmm. stumbled and they fell. Mm -hmm. But they, with my help, they got up again. Look at King David. Yes. Now, there are many Christians who believe that the, the key to salvation is that God just forgives sinners. Everyone is forgiven by God. Amen. God is willing to forgive everyone. And where's the evidence for that? Luke 23, 34. Jesus said, forgive them, Father. They don't know what they're doing. And he said this as they're nailing him to the cross. Mm -hmm. Forgive them, Father. They don't know what they're doing. Many Christians believe that the Father was a stern, unforgiving judge and that if it were not for the constant pleading of Jesus on our behalf, we would all be lost. That totally unbiblical view is pagan and satanic. Forgive me for saying that. You know what John 3.16 says, God so loved the world, right? Well, here's one that gives a little more detail to that. John 16, verses 25 to 27. I, that was Jesus, Jesus was the one speaking, have used figures of speech to tell you these things, but the time will come when I will not use figures of speech, but will speak to you plainly about the Father. Now here is the Son of God, himself divine, appearing on, the human, on this world as a human being, speaking to his closest group of, of friends that are gathered around that table the night before his, he was arrested and tried, Okay, there he is, and he says, let me tell you plainly about the Father. Now, wouldn't that be an important thing for us to know? Yeah. Plainly about the Father. When that day comes, you will ask him in my name, and I do not say, I do not say that I will ask him on your behalf. Why not? Why is it not necessary for God to, for Jesus to plead on our behalf? He already knows. For the Father himself loves you. He loves you because you love me and have believed that I came from God. What happened to all that pleading? The Father loves us just, just yeah. as much as Jesus does. Yeah. Mm -hmm. that's, what, that's the Bible's message. Right. That may not be Christianity's or some forms of Christianity's message, but that's the Bible's so message. So when Thomas says, show us the Father, 
He says, he who has seen me has seen the Father. This right. is it. This yeah. is, you're seeing the Father in me. Mm -hmm. Think of it like this. Someone falls overboard from a boat in the middle of a storm. Another person grabs a life preserver, and of course they have ro ropes connected to them, and throws it out to him, and then hauls him back into the boat. The one who really has to work is the one who throws the life preserver. Mm -hmm. But the one who is rescued must hang on to the life preserver. What can that teach us about God's grace and our response? And what happened about the, after the flood? What can we learn from the story of the rainbow? Genesis 9, 12, and 13. God said, this is a sign of the covenant that I make bet between, excuse me, that I make between me and you, every living creature that is with you for all future generations. Okay, I want to stop and interrupt there for just a second. We're talking about which of these covenants are for all future generations? Here, right here. For all future generations. That's the title of our lesson this, this time. Okay. I have set my bow in the clouds, and it shall be a sign of the covenant between me and the earth. You revised standard. Okay, so every time you step outside and it's raining, and you look up and you see a rainbow, you know what? God's covenant is still good. The God's covenant is still good. There are not many natural phenomenon, phenomena that are as colorful as a rainbow. In some places where the rain is fairly heavy and the sun is bright, I used to live at right just a short distance from the equator, uh, in both in t Kenya for a while and in Tanzania for a while, and they have some very heavy rainstorms there. You can actually see a double rainbow. Beautiful. I've actually seen a triple rainbow. They're so beautiful that many groups have taken the rainbow as a symbol for their organizations. Yeah. So what was God's original plan with the rainbow? Genesis 9, 12 through 17, God said, as a sign of their everlasting covenant, which I am making with you and with all living beings, I am putting my bow in the clouds. It will be the sign of my covenant with the world. Whenever I cover the sky with clouds and the rainbow appears, I will remember my promise to you and to all the animals that a flood will never again destroy all living beings. When the rainbow appears in the clouds, I will see it and remember the everlasting covenant between me and all living beings on the earth. This is the sign of the promise which I am making to all living beings. Goodness Bible. Okay, is this God saying, oh, I almost forgot. I promised I wouldn't destroy them with a flood. Whew. It's a good thing I saw the rainbow. <laughs> One no. thing I wanted to do, no, no. does that mean there was no light refraction until that came in? No, there just wasn't any rain. There was no clouds. There were no clouds, there was no rain. Everything was, everything was watered from moisture that came up from under the ground. So this is, this is the very first time there was any rain. And so you can imagine if people knew the story of the flood and the first time it started rain was this, whoosh, the, you know, the whole heavens just collapse. The next time it rains, what are you going to be doing? You're going to be running for the hills, right? Yes. The God says, no, just look up. The rainbow's there. I promised. You don't need to worry. But the rainbow is very different from a normal covenant. We do not have to do anything to benefit from the rainbow except to look. Of course, if we take advantage of God's promise given to us with the, with the rainbow, then God does the saving. But the rainbow itself is given to every living creature of all flesh for all future generations. That's what it said. We just read that. From this, we can learn that God's forgiveness is like that as well. We are all forgiven, but we do not all realize it. And we certainly do not, do not all take advantage of God's offer. By giving the rainbow, God has pronounced never to, as promised, I'm sorry, never to destroy the whole world with a flood. This, that is one serious problem that we can stop worrying about. What else could, should we learn from the rainbow? What are we told about the conclusions to the flood? Harry, I think that's yours. Read from Genesis chapter 7, verse 23. He blotted out every living thing that was upon the face of the ground, man and animals and creeping things and birds of the air. 
They were blotted out from the earth. Only Noah was left and those that were with him in the ark. And that comes from the Revised Standard Version. Okay, now when we say something was left, what do we call that? Remnant. remnant. A remnant. Okay, you want to read this, another version, the New King James Version, same verse, yeah. Carrie? Yes. So he destroyed all living things which were on the face of the ground, both man and cattle, creeping thing and bird of the air. They were destroyed from the earth. Only Noah and those who were with him in the ark remained alive. And that's from the okay. New King James Version. So now what have we done? We have linked the idea of God's covenant with a remnant. Yes. Right? Yeah. Notice for the first time God mentioned what might be called a remnant, those who were left or remained alive. Remnant is a key word in many passages of Scripture. All the way back from Genesis 45, 7, Joseph said to his brothers, And God sent me before you to preserve for you a remnant on earth and to keep alive for you many survivors. Isaiah 4, verse 3, And he who is left in Zion and remains in Jerusalem will be called holy. Everyone who has been recorded for life in Jerusalem, Revised Standard Version. And then Isaiah 11, 11, In that day the Lord will extend his hand yet a second time to recover the remnant which is left of his people. So what is the relationship between remnant and covenant? God, in effect, became the judge for the entire world. Those who got on the boat were saved. Those who did not were lost. We need to remember, however, that this was not the final judgment of any of those people. That final judgment was to come thousands of years later in the pre-advent judgment, which is going on right now. There may have been some people who wanted to get on the boat, but could not because they were prevented by others. That's, that's possible. We don't know. It's possible. But what we know is that it was Noah and his family that got on and in. And so God promised that special relationship with Noah and his family, Genesis 6:18. Do any verses come to mind that would suggest that what happened in Noah's day might be similar to what will happen at the end of this world's history, Jim? Matthew 24, 37, Jesus said, The coming of the Son of Man will be like what happened in the time of Noah. Yeah. Revelation 12, 17, The dragon was furious and the woman, and, was coming with the woman, and went off to fight against the rest of her descendants. All those who obey God's commandments and are faithful to the truth revealed by Jesus. There we have another remnant, the rest of her descendants, right? Okay, to get a wonderful picture of many of the details of the flood and what happened before and after the flood, I would really encourage you to look at the book Patriarchs and Prophets and read from pages 90 to 110. Charles? The rainbow, a natural phenomenon, was fitting symbol of God's promise never to destroy the earth again by flood. Inasmuch as the climatic uh, conditions of the earth would be completely different after the flood, the rains would, in most parts of the world, take the place of the former beneficent due to moisture in the soil. Something was needed to quiet men's fears. Each time rain began to fall, the spiritual mind can see in natural phenomena, phenomena God's revelations of himself. Romans 1 20. Thus the rainbow is evidence to the believer that the rain will bring blessing and not universal destruction. Article on Genesis 9 15. This is by F.D. Nico, S.D. Bible Commentary. Uh, for those of you who might have had some experience with some of the rainy seasons in, in the tropics, <clears throat> you can be standing somewhere and then all of a sudden it's almost like you're standing under a faucet. Just Whew. I mean, and you can see why people who were, you know, there's another flood coming. Wow. There are and have been many cultures in the world that have had, have or had flood stories. One of the very famous ones is known as the Epic of Gilgamesh. Carrie? In those days, the world teemed, the people multiplied, 
The world bellowed like a wild bull, and the great god was aroused by the clamor. Now let me interrupt for just a second. This, this story is written not in English, not in Hebrew, not in Greek. It's written in cuneiform. Mm -hmm. So this is someone who's translated from cuneiform, so you, the, the language might seem a little strange to us. Okay? Okay. Enlil heard the clamor, and he said to the gods in council... Now, Enlil was the chief of the gods. Mm. Okay. Okay, I'll pick that up. The uproar of mankind is intolerable, and sleep is no longer possible by reason of the Babel. So the gods agreed to exterminate man. That's from the story <laughs> of the flood, <laughs> Epic of Gilgamesh. Does that sound like a little different version of how the flood happened <laughs> from the Bible, what the, from the Bible version? So the, the gods are disturbed by all the noise people are making, so they decide to wipe out human beings. They're making too much noise. <laughs> now, Gilgal is a biblical word. Uh, yeah. Gilgal, yeah, that's, yeah, that's Gilgal. a place in the Bible. But yeah. That's the place, not Gilgamesh. No, Gilgamesh is a, is a man who tried to journey somewhere. He heard rumors that there was someone who had the secret to eternal life. Oh. One of his friends died. One of his friends died, and, and so Gilgamesh said, Oof, I don't want that to happen to me. There's somebody here that knows that has a secret, and so he goes off to try to find the secret to eternal life, and this mm -hmm. is part of that story. Compare this reason for the flood to the reason given in the Bible. Was the flood actually a rescue of God's last contact on this rebellious planet? Think about it. God is going down and he's reaching out and he's grabbing that last family that are still faithful and putting them on a boat to preserve them from what was going on around them. Noah and his family, so that God would not completely lose contact with the human race. So why are the truths of salvation generally unpopular? Think about these verses, John 3, verses 17 to 21. Jesus said, this is Jesus' conversation with Nicodemus, remember, for God did not send his Son into the world to be its judge, but to be its Savior. Those who believe in the Son are not judged, but those who do not believe have already been judged because they have not believed in God's only Son. This is how the judgment works. The light has come into the world, but people love the darkness rather than the light. So what's the problem here? They love darkness instead of light, because their deeds are evil. All those who do evil things hate the light. They will not come to the light because they do not want their evil deeds to be shown up. So what happens if the, 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 the light of the entire universe, God, shows up? What are they going to be doing? They're going to be crying for the rocks, rocks in the mountains to fall on them, right? But those who do what is true come to the light in order that the light may show that what they did was in obedience to God. And another parallel thing, could you go ahead and read those for us, Jim? John 7 here. John 7, verses 47 and 48. Did he fool you too? The Pharisees asked him. Have you ever known one of the authorities or one Pharisee to believe in him? John 12, 42 and 43. Even then, many of the Jewish authorities believed in Jesus, but because of the Pharisees, they did not talk about it openly, so as not to be expelled from the synagogue. They loved human approval rather than the approval of God. Good news, Bible. Okay, well, in light of that, I, we have to just take a quick peek over at a couple of other verses that happened later. Acts 6, verse 7. And so the word of God continued to spread. The number of disciples in Jerusalem grew larger and larger, and a great number of priests, priests accepted the faith. And so what happens next? Look at Acts 15, verse 5. They had that general conference, the first general conference there in Jerusalem. But some of the believers, these are, these are now Christians, who belong to the party of the Pharisees stood up and said the Gentiles must be circumcised and they told to obey and told to obey the law of Moses. So they hadn't given up all their old old ideas, but we see very clearly that who and who had become Christians? Some of the priests yeah. and many of the Pharisees became Christians. Okay? 
James 4, verse 4. Unfaithful people, don't you know that to be world's friends means to be God's enemies, uh, God's enemy? People who want to be the world's friends make themselves God's enemies. You know, one thing about, the, take a particular a, a person, maybe a good scholar, but he's gotten in, into the, the church or uh, mm -hmm. take a, a Catholic uh, priest or somebody like that, a good scholar, but his economic situation, his cultural well-being, uh, that's a tremendous hold that could be on a person. That doesn't mean he's yeah. not going to be in the hereafter, but uh, it, it's a really... Yeah, they're in. They're already in into that. Yeah. Well, think of some other issues involved. Well, well, anyway, first before we jump on to the next, think about that. So basically, God says there's going to be two groups. There are basically two groups even now in this world. Now things are still not permanently fixed, but there's God's side and there's the devil's side. There's not going to be a third group. We're each one of us going to have to choose. We want to do God's way, or do we want to do it Satan's way? So think of some other issues involved with the story of Noah. Who paid for all the materials and all the workmen uh, to build that boat? As far as we know, there, were no, there was no form of monetary exchange used in Noah's day. Nobody had the first coins or the first, there, nobody had no printing of bills or anything like that. Who paid them and, and people, and how did they pay for them? Did people volunteer to help? We don't know, maybe. Okay. Charles? The symbol, the rainbow in the clouds, was to confirm the belief of all and establish their confidence in God, for it was a token of divine mercy and goodness to man, that although God had been provoked to destroy the earth by the flood, yet his mercy still encompassed the earth. God says, when he looked upon the bow in the cloud, he will remember. He would not have us understand that he would ever forget, but speaks to man in his own language that man may better understand him. Ellen White, Spiritual Gifts, Volume 3, 74, 74. That was clear back in 1864. Mm -hmm. yeah. Very early in her ministry. Second uh, year after the church was organized. Yep. Yep. Mm -hmm. And so she says, not that God would ever forget, but he speaks to us in what? Yeah. Our language. And why does he do that? He wants us to understand him. Well, when you think of Adventist World Radio, they are listening to it in their own language. Yep. And elsewhere. Yeah. Hundreds of them. Yeah. It might be easier for us to understand that statement when considering this. Carrie? Men before the flood lived many hundreds of years, and when 100 years old, they were considered but youths. Mm -hmm. They came upon the stage of action from the ages of 60 to 100 years. That, that's when they're just sort of getting going in life. Yeah. About the time those who now live have passed off the stage. And that's from Ellen White's Comments and Bible Commentary, Volume 1, 1089, Paragraph 9. Okay, the statement in Genesis 6.18, though brief, contains profound concepts. It predicts provisions for the future of humankind. In establishing this covenant with the one to survive the flood with his family, God dispenses his bountiful grace and mercy. Humankind's security and the presence and assurance of salvation in the future arise out of God's grace and the divine action in their behalf. Garrett Hosel and Michael Hosel, The Promise, God's Everlasting Covenant, page 29. For those of us who understand something of how a rainbow is formed by the sun shining through the raindrops, uh, like a prism, it might be dismissed as a simple but beautiful phenomenon. But rainbows are mentioned elsewhere in very special places. Jim? Where else do we find rainbows talked about? Ezekiel 1, verses 26 to 28. Above the dome, there was something that looked like a throne made of sapphire. And sitting on the throne was a figure that looked like a human being. The figure seemed to be shining like bronze in the middle of a fire. It shone all over with a bright light and had in it 
all the colors of the rainbow. This was the dazzling light that shows the presence of the Lord. Good News Bible. Okay, now, so let's interpret that for, for all of us to, to agree on what we're saying. God's throne is surrounded by what? Colors of the rainbow. A rainbow. Yeah. God's throne is surrounded by a rainbow. Okay? Then a rainbow, shining with the glory from the throne of God, spans the heavens and seems to encircle each praying company. The angry multitudes are suddenly arrested. Their mocking cries die away. The objects of their murderous rage are forgotten. With fearful forebodings, they gaze upon the symbol of God's covenant and long to be shielded from its overpowering brightness. You know, that reminds you a little bit about uh, Isaiah 34, 14. Yeah. They, who dwells in the everlasting burnings? Mm -hmm. It's the righteous. Yeah. Yeah, in God's presence. Yeah. This, that was from Great Controversy 635 and 636. And that's talking about how God will preserve the righteous at, at the final end when everybody else is trying to... Satan is doing everything he possibly can to destroy God's faithful people. But they will be protected by what? A rainbow. Is it really true that Noah's family were the only ones saved in the ark? Why was only Noah left? The first explicit mention of a remnant in the Bible occurs in Genesis 7:23. Only Noah, Noah was left. And those that were with him in the ark, RSV. The word translated was left derives from the Hebrew root sar. Are, hmm. of which different forms of expression and the remnant idea in the Old Testament. We cannot overlook the fact that the remnant who survived the first worldwide catastrophe were people of faith and trust because the Bible used the Noahic flood as a type of end time destruction. This observation has much significance. Gerhard F. F. Hessel and Michael G. Hessel, the promise of God's everlasting covenant. Okay. This does not mean, however, that there were uh, none righteous besides Noah. What, what else do we know, Carrie? Some of the carpenters he, Noah, employed in building the ark believed the message but died before the flood. Others of Noah's converts backslid. That comes from Ellen G. White, Review and Herald, August 16, 1906. So it sounds like all the people actually worked on the boat, at least while they were working on the boat, were, were believers. And they had, yes. And it, 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 didn't uh, Noah preach to them as well somewhere? I'm yeah. learning that years yeah. ago. Methuselah died a few years before. One year. One year, huh? One yeah. year before. Yeah. One man's assertion against the wisdom of thousands. They would not credit the warning. Christ declares that there will exist similar unbelief concerning his second coming. When the luxury of the world becomes the luxury of the church, when the marriage bells are chiming and all are looking forward to many years of worldly prosperity, then suddenly as the lightning flashes will come the end of their bright visions and delusive hopes. Again, from the Great Controversy, page 337 through 339. There's a very interesting ancient story from the city of Athens, and I would remind you that Athens was where democracy was first tried as a form of government. They invented machines, actually, for voting, so that everybody could just a fair vote. Um, one of the finest ancient, and some of those machines, you can see them if you visit the, one of the museums there in Athens. Mm -hmm. Um, one of the finest ancient men who lived there was a man by the name of Aristides. He is described as being just, kind, and fair. And guess what happened to him? The majority of the citizens of the city chose to banish him from the city because his goodness apparently contrasted too sharply with the badness of others. Nothing new. <laughs> yes, true. Nothing new. <laughs> Crazy as can be. Yeah. Compare the story of Noah. We would never have known about the evil in Noah's day if we did not have the story of Noah. Think about your own experience. Are you and Noah in your society? 
There are so many evil pressures surrounding us. How can we possibly survive? Romans 12, 1 and 2. So then, my brothers and sisters, because of God's great mercy to us, I appeal to you. Offer yourselves as a living sacrifice to God. That means he's not asking us to die. He's not asking us to burn us on an altar. Living sacrifice. Dedicated to his service and pleasing to him. This is the true worship that you should offer. Do not conform yourselves to the standards of this world, but let God transform you inwardly by a complete change uh, in, of your mind. Then you will be able to know the will of God, what is, the good, what is good and what is pleasing to Him and is perfect. So what do you think the people in Noah's day would have done with Him if they had an option? Did any, any of them want to kill Him? Probably. Think of the stories of Canaan and Lamech. If there had been mental hospitals in Noah's day, would they have tried to continue uh, to confine him to one? The most important question connected with the story is why God did what he did. And we're, uh, I think we still have time. Genesis 6, verses 6 and 7, he was sorry that he had ever made them and put them on the earth. He was so filled with regret that he said, I will wipe out these people I have created and also the animals and the birds because I'm sorry that I made any of them. And I hope now from our discussion that you've got some better ideas about why God did that. We believe that God has foreknowledge. Why did God, a God who has foreknowledge and knew in advance that all this was coming, allow it to happen? The truth about sin and its consequences needed to be demonstrated. The great controversy was already in full swing. When the flood approached, Noah and his family were apparently the only ones finally left alive that were paying any attention to God. So what does that teach us about our day? God has always claimed that he, was, well, he has and will or will have a group of people who re remain, will remain faithful to him no matter what happens. The 144,000 will be that group in the end. By contrast, Satan has claimed that anyone who is truly free would join his side. So which side are we going to be on? Some people are quite disturbed by the idea of a remnant. Does it, does it seem arrogant or prejudicial? Uh, if we know all that God has gone through to save us and our efforts at hanging on to the life preserver that God has provided, there is certainly no reason for being proud. Are we hanging on tightly? Are we so committed to God and His truth and liberty that we would never give it up? Our kind and wonderful Father, we thank you for the privilege we have of studying these things and learning these very important lessons about your covenants. Help us to be thankful for the blessing of having these promises you've made to us. May we hold on to them forever is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Amen.